to begin with, I'll start a roll call. Um, Commissioner Vincent, are you present? Yeah, I Great. am. Uh, Commissioner Jimenez, are you present? Yes. Great. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Thank you. And I, um, Commissioner Scafano is present, so we have quorum. Um, so the first order of business, are there any neighborhood representatives here today? I will take that as a no. So the next um, item is public comment on non-agenda items germane to the business of the commission. Are there any public comment? There are none at the moment, but Thank just you. a reminder for those who are joining telephonically to re mute or mute yourself, press star six and to press star nine to raise your hand. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, so we'll move on to the next agenda item, public comment germane to the agenda items. Scott, are there, is there any public comment? There and then. Okay, great. All right, so we'll move on to the next item, approval of the minutes. Uh, these are action items. Uh, have the other commissioners uh, had a chance to review the meeting minutes from March 9th? And if so, do you have any comments or questions? Move adoption. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Vincent. So we'll do a quick uh, vote. Uh, Commissioner Jimenez, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Commissioner Vincent? Yes. And I also vote yes. So the minutes are approved. I will sign them and send them back. Uh, the next item are the meeting minutes from the March 31st, 2022 meeting. Um, are there any questions or comments from any of the commissioners? I'll take that as a no. Um, do we have a motion to approve? So move. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Is there a second? Must I second everything? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> okay, so we have a second from Commissioner Vincent. So we'll do a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Jimenez, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Vincent? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Great, and I also vote yes, Commissioner Scafano. So I will sign these and send these back. Um, the next item is, um, is the findings to continue our teleconferencing meetings pursuant to AB 361 action items. So I'll just read this paragraph. Um, recommendation to adopt the findings and determination in, in, in accordance with AB 361 section 3E3 that while the state of emergency due to COVID-19, due to the COVID-19 pandemic as originally proclaimed by the governor on March 4th, 2020, remains active and or state or local officials have imposed or recommended measures to promote social distancing. This legislative body has reconsidered the circumstances of the state of emergency era that the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of members to meet safely in person and or state or local officials um, continue to impose a recommend to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing. So this is actually an action item and we'll need to vote on this. Um, is there a motion to approve? I move to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Vincent. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Jimenez. So do a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Jefferson, how do you vote? Sorry, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Vincent? Yes. Commissioner Jimenez? Yes. And I also vote yes, so the motion's approved, so we can continue to meet uh, teleconferencing. So the next item um, is the Arts Activation Fund. And we were, we're going to have a, a recommendation from Daniel Chirica, our general manager. Um, and the 
Item A is the historical Venice Cinco de Mayo Parade and Festival. So Daniel, I'll let you. Sure, sure. Um, actually, I think what, what we are doing is we, you as a commission will be making the recommendation to me as the general manager. Um, so that I have, I will have final, I'll have final approval over these. So I look forward to hearing, um, hearing the presentations as they come forward and to your recommendations. Thank you. Great. Okay. So the, f the first item is the historical Venice Cinco de Mayo parade and festival, which is, um, coming up very soon. Uh, the location is along Lincoln Boulevard between California and Rose. It's a parade. Um, it's in Council District 11, and the staff member, Ben Espinoza, I think will be presenting, So and Joe Smoke. So, Ben. Hi. Uh, very good welcome. afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, ben Espinoza from the Department of Cultural Affairs, Grants Administration Division. Uh, we have three projects uh, lined up here for your, temp for your consideration today. Uh, the first one up is Historical Cinco de Mayo Parade and Festival. Uh, I'll, I'll note real, right off the bat, this is coming back after a two-year hiatus due to COVID. They're requesting $7,500 in city funding to produce a parade along Lincoln Boulevard that will culminate in a park-adjacent street festival on 7th Street in Venice. It's going to take place in, on April 30th, so that's coming up. I'm planning to involve 100 various individual artists and expected to serve up to 500 or more members of the Venice community. Uh, letters of support have been submitted by the Office of Council Member Mike Bonin of the 11th District and the Venice Community Clinic. I'm going to share my screen now, and, and while I do so, I'd like to invite the events producer, Ms. Laura Ceballos, to unmute yourself, introduce yourself to the commission, and to tell us more details about your event. Give me a second here as I move my screen around. Laura, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, hi. My name is uh, Laura Ceballos, and so um, this is the Hor historical Venice. Cinco de Mayo Parade and Festival. Uh, next slide, please. Is it? Okay. So the historical Cinco de Mayo Parade uh, and Festival was created in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement and the Chicano Movement. It was brought back after a 32-year gap. The Cinco de Mayo, also called the anniversary of the Battle of Puebla, is a holiday celebrated in parts of Mexico and the United States in honor of a military victory in 1862 over the French forces of Napoleon III. The parade will be an hour long from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And so the parade will feature Aztec dancers, folklorico dancers, local bands, cheerleaders, classic cars, low riders, charros, which are horses, um, uh, floats and mariachi uh, performers. The route um, will block off a major state highway of, as you can see the map on the right. So it'll begin on California um, Avenue and Lincoln Boulevard. It'll go down Lincoln Boulevard going north to Rose Avenue and on Rose Avenue, it'll make a left going west um, to 7th Avenue. And on 7th Avenue, it'll make uh, another left going south um, to Broadway, actually to California, right in front of Oakwood Park. And then it'll be followed by a, um, the parade will be followed by a street festival featuring live band dancing performances, mariachi, food trucks, informational booths, and family friendly activities such as um, face painting and games for children. Um, the participants that we have are the Aztec dancers, um, folklorico dancers, mariachi, live cumbia band from Spaghetti Cumbia, DJs, Venice High School Band, Venice High School Cheerleaders, Santa Monica College Cheerleaders, Venice Community Housing, Venice Heritage Museum, Venice Community House, um, Venice Family Clinic, excuse me, Charro Horses, Classic Cars and Lowriders, the Traquero Monument, um, Broadway Elementary School, and, um, and, and that's it. So out of the um, parade, the Venice Cinco de Mayo Parade, um, the Venice Mexican American Traquero Monument is, is going to be created and it came out of the parade. Um, it was passed on Cinco de Mayo of 2021. Um, Dolores Huerta spoke on behalf of the committee and it was passed unanimous, unanimously by the LA City Council. The projected date is 2024 and this will be the first monument ever on the west side and in Venice to honor Mexican and Mexican American railroad workers known as traqueros who helped construct and maintain the main railroad transportation system. 
and the Pacific Electric Interurban System uh, in Los Angeles. So we're very proud of, of, um, of the monument. And so this is a picture of um, the mariachi in the past, one of the floats that was created. Um, and this is the Venice High School Band and Cheerleaders. These are just a few photos. And the Venice High School uh, Mecha, who was involved, and um, the Venice High School Band. And so here we have the budget. Um, I know the budget's a little bit um, conservative, but um, we got uh, started um, a little bit late. We weren't sure, you know, we just got over a pandemic or we're still in a pandemic. So a lot of the schools weren't sure um, what was going to happen. And so um, that's why it might, you might see a little bit like of a tight budget there, but we're hoping that the next year we're able, we'll be in a better position. And um, I would like to end with that. And if anybody has any questions, um, I'll be glad to answer. Great, thank you, Laura. So I will open up the floor and see if any of the fellow commissioners have any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, one good morning or good afternoon, I should say, and thank you so much for presenting this. And I, I want to mm -hmm. just stop and 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 thank you for um, making sure that you that you stated the distinction between what Cinco de Mayo is. There's so many people who think it's Mexican Independence Day, and mm -hmm. I I say this in the context of how important Cinco de Mayo was to stopping the threat of slavery moving into the Western states. Uh, had, the, had, the Mexican, had the Mexican country not defeated the French, slavery would have actually embedded itself in Western California. So I often say to my um, brothers and sisters of African descent, you probably should be celebrating Cinco de Mayo even more. So the more we can make sure everyone understands the totality of that rich history the greater it is for all of us. So thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Uh, Commissioner Vincent, do you have any questions no, or I comments? Think it's a great event. Yep. Commissioner you. Jimenez. Um, no, I just want to say that I, I think it's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic project. And um, I, I just really appreciate Commissioner Jefferson's um, words and insights on Cinco de Mayo. And um, I, I just really appreciate you, Commissioner Jefferson. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll also follow up with thank you, Commissioner Jefferson, because actually I, I, you educated me on knowing more about Cinco de Mayo. And I appreciate your comments on for what it's worth, I've been advocating that position <laughs> since I ran the California African American Museum. And every single de Mayo, I would stand there and ask the entire audience, didn't matter what background, do you know what this day really is? <laughs> mm -hmm. No. <clears throat> yeah. And I'll give you one more tidbit. Mexico had a, a stamp of Martin Luther King before the United States. Wow, that's great. I, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Let's go celebrate. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, so on that note, do we have a motion to approve um, the I Cinco de Mayo? Sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Vincent. I move to approve. Thank you so much. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. So we'll have a quick vote. Commissioner Jimenez, how do you vote? Yes. Great. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Commissioner Vincent? Yes. And I also vote yes, so motion approved, and we're all very excited to attend the parade. I, I attended a few years ago, and it was really fun. So looking yeah. forward to it again. Thank you so much, and thank you, Laura. So the next- Thank you for your support. Yep, mm -hmm. great. Okay. So the next item is item B, which is Rock the Block. And um, this is uh, in, uh, 54th Street, 4th and 7th Avenue. And again, Ben Espinoza will be presenting from DCA. And uh, they are requesting a civic support from the DCA. 
Thank you, Commissioner Grafano. Um, a, a quick contextual note uh, before we jump into these next two projects. I thought I'd highlight that these next two proposals were submitted under a special grant category that DCA made available this year that we are called Community Activation Fund. Uh, this is intended to create and sustain signature family friendly community events in five historically arts underserved council districts. Um, these projects are eligible for larger grants of up to $20,000 and they can take place in a range of street adjacent family friendly spaces like parks, schoolyards, parking lots and other outdoor sites that would otherwise have been ineligible under our traditional arts activation fund. So these projects are meant to be carried out in close collaboration with the council offices of those five historically arts underserved council districts, which are council districts three, six, eight, nine and 12. So the first one up is Rock the Block. Rock the Block is a new community festival to be produced by Whitehall Arts Academy based in Council District 8. They are requesting $20,000 in funding to produce a three block long community festival along 54th Street in Crenshaw. Uh, the event's gonna take place on Sunday, July 31st to involve more than seven artists and performing arts ensembles and is expected to reach up to 5,000 members of the community. Letters of support have been submitted by the office of Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson of the 8th District. And since the publication of the meeting agenda, an additional letter of support was submitted by Luis Gabriel, founder of Orthodox, which is another community organization cited along the event's location on 54th Street. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite Ms. Tanisha White, the, the founder and executive director of Whitehall's Arts Academy to unmute herself, tell us more about the event. And I will share the PowerPoint as well. Hi everyone, how are you today? It's a pleasure to be on with you all. So my name is Tanisha Hall and I am the founder of Whitehall Arts Academy, which is a nonprofit performing arts academy that I started now 11 years ago um, on 54th Street in a building that my grandparents owned. And we had this idea actually last year, we wanted to have it as our 10 year anniversary celebration, but we all know what we were dealing with last year. So we've kind of postponed it and we're gonna celebrate it right before we reach year 11. So our idea was Whitehall Arts Academy is all about youth and family. We service um, you know, families in CD8, CD10, all over LA and as well as virtually. So we wanted to have a love letter to our community because not that many things happen in our community. And a lot of things don't happen that are geared towards family and children. And that's what we wanna do with our festival is have it to hopefully be an annual event that focuses on family and children. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So to give you a little background on Whitehall Arts Academy. So since we started 10, now 11 years ago, we've reached over 5,000 people here in the local LA area as well as worldwide. <laughs> Um, we also reach, we teach at schools locally at Crete, um, at schools in Compton and Watts. We are also involved with youth centers and, and um, you know, we kind of have our hands all over the South LA area. Um, for Whitehall Arts Academy, our students have now gone on to win Grammys, to be on The Voice, to be on American Idol. And you hear their records on the radio because we focus on contemporary music. Our students are also going to Ivy League and highly acclaimed colleges like Brown University, USC, my alma mater, Berkeley College of Music. So what we're doing in this community is huge things and we're kind of what people call a hidden gem. So we thought this would be a great opportunity to bring to bring attention to not only Whitehall, but 54th, because there's a lot of activation happening on 54th, which I think gets overlooked because we're such a small street. So you can go to the next one. So being we're about eight blocks east of Crenshaw, and we know Crenshaw is is a main hub of South Los Angeles. And we we have partnered with, as you'll see soon, we partnered with this Crenshaw, Destination Crenshaw, because we feel like it's really important to involve all of our community partners in what we're doing and celebrating our area, which is very, it's just a very unique area of Los Angeles, specifically Black LA. You can go to the next slide. So our partners are um, Langdon Park Capital, which is a new, which is a very new um, real estate development company. And they're working to build communities throughout South LA and the world. Destination Crenshaw, of course. Chase has come in as a huge supporter, both financially and helping with programs. Um, Pasadena Showcase House for the Arts just gave us a one, an amazing grant towards um, Tech Lamert, who does a conference in Lamert Park every fall. They've come in to do an activation as well, as well as CD8, 
ourselves and Tiffany Haddish's She Ready Foundation. I am a foster parent as well as um, Tiffany being a former foster youth. So the foster community is huge to our heart. So we really want to involve the She Ready Foundation and make sure that we're giving back, you know, and making it beneficial to everyone that's in need. You can go to the next one. So to talk about our, we are, next is the budget. So you'll see we have these great partners. Our event is slated to cost about $100,000. We've raised so far almost $50,000. Um, we're looking to use the money from DCA to help us support our performers. And we want to pay our performers very well. We have Aunt Grammy Award winning um, singer who's also Whitehall student, Aunt Clemens. We have, um, and all these, all these, um, Everybody who's performing is connected to Whitehall Arts Academy. Either they've attended, they're friends of, they're supporters. We have, um, of course, award-winning singer Shanice. We have Jordan Banks, who is Billboard chart-winning artist who studies at Whitehall. We also have current students, Berkeley, um, Berkeley Warwick. And we have Jordan Simone, who's a Whitehall student who was on American Idol and The Voice, as well as um, 1500 or nothing. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're in Inglewood, but they're all Grammy award-winning um, producers and and songwriters, and they're gonna come in and, and be a part of our event as a donated expense, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, we're in local church bands, and we're also gonna have you know community involvement from other community organizations as well. So the event is slated to take place Sunday, July 31st, um, from one to seven on 54th Street, where we wanna block off between 4th and 7th Ave and have the main stage be um, between the blocks of 6th and 7th Ave in front of our location. And we estimate about 5,000 people attending throughout the day. Um, so it's supposed to be, we're, we're planning a really fun event um, with vendors who chase in their minority business, um, this their minority business, I can't say it right, minority entrepreneurship program. They're gonna be helping us to get vendors who are local minority entrepreneurs like myself. And we have food trucks and the community, our local school, the Alliance Olichi Complex, they're involved in donating their space. Um, so I'll give you a quick walkthrough of what we expect the day to be like. So you can go to the next slide. So we expect to have performances and stages and all kind of stuff. So we can go to the next one. So performances, you'll see all these amazing performers are so attractive and we have DJs and performers and artists. We've also reached out to Fernando Pullum Community Arts Center to get their kids performing and Lula Washington Dance Company and Crucial Kids. Um, Cause we wanna share this day with our, again, with our community partners. Um, and the, also on the main stage, we're gonna have um, Powered by Chase, conversations about financial literacy. We wanna do a panel called Incorporate Your Hustle, you know, cause everybody in the hood has a hustle, whether it's braiding or doing hair or something. And, you know, in order to give people the empowerment to know that, you know, these financial institutions are available for you. Um, so we wanna use this day as not just a day of fun and entertainment, but also education and empowerment. Um, we can go to the next one. Um, and our activations, like I said, we have an amazing activation, a gaming activation and tech with um, Tech Lemert that's gonna be at Orthodox LA. We have an amazing partnership with the Knowledge Shop, another organization on 54th Street. And we wanna do an activation centered there around at education, advocacy, and parent engagement. Um, in addition, we also near the Olichi campus wanna have what we call a kid's corner. So that's gonna be dedicated solely to children where we're gonna have like inflatables and face painting and a kid's stage where they can perform. And I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Next. <laughs> so we also wanna empower our local our local um our local community members by having again the vendor row that's going to be um, sponsored by Chase as well as food trucks like my favorite thing in the world Happy Ice um, supermarket which brings fresh fruit, fresh um, groceries to the community they're a huge friend of Whitehall so supermarket um, E Double and Burger Guys we want to bring healthy food and fun to 54th Street next and that's it so. Merry Christmas. I appreciate your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tanisha. Um, that was great. Uh, is there anyone else that's going to speak or? Just me. Just you. Super. Okay, great. I'm going to ask the fellow commissioners if they have any questions or comments. Um, I have a question kind of of staff. Um, <laughs> is it possible in events like this? I remember way back in the day, uh, cultural affairs used to have a um, uh, produced street scene, which was a big downtown festival. Um, 
for communities that are doing these kind of wonderful events, do we have any way of helping them with, uh, aside from the cash or in addition to the cash, um, like for instance, uh, aiding them in the permitting or uh, providing security or um, whatever, is there, is there kind of a, a, a or, or can we develop kind of a, a bunch of resources for communities that are, are trying to do these kind of public performances and celebrations? Um, is that a question directed to Ben or? Uh, well, yeah. anybody on staff who would know. I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to jump in on this one Daniel, for a moment. Right. Uh, so what I can say is that this is definitely, this is definitely a need that we're aware of. Um, it is something that we had been trying to do a few years prior to pandemic. And I think that as we have been looking ahead towards Olympics and, and really wanting to be able to support our communities, uh, it is something that we as a department and, and other departments are interested in helping to support too. So. Uh, it is definitely something high on our on on our radar right now that we would like to be able to figure out how to do. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time, um, but we definitely want to be supportive of organizations like Whitehall and and others um, as we go forward um, with with festivals and as festivals start coming back. So, absolutely, thank you, Commissioner Vincent. We are we are on the same page with you as far as wanting to be able to be that support. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Commissioner Jefferson, I see you raising your hand. Um, can we go back to the budget page for a second? I just have a question or two. Um, right. So <clears throat> are you, are all of the vendors having the opportunity to be able to vend at this festival without having to pay a fee or any kind of donation to you? That's part of the um, the support that we're receiving from Chase. We would we do want the vendors to be able to be there without having to um, pay a fee. So as we have in the budget right now, um, that the vendors will be selected vendors part of the Chase Minority Entrepreneurship Program. Um, so they'll be able to participate. But we do we don't want to keep it only limited to them because um, I think there's about forty or fifty vendors along with myself who are part of that program. Um, we want to keep it open to everybody, but that's who we've kind of planned for this initial event because rather than having to go out and, and kind of scour for other vendors. I hope that answers your question. It does. Um, if they, you know, if they, if it's sponsored by Chase and it's Chase vendors, then it's a little easier to sort of get if the idea is that people who are, um, in the business of vending are participating in the project, which they should be, I'm not objecting to them doing it. I'm just questioning and making, wondering whether or not your dollars or the city's dollars were going to that. And let me just give you the context for it. Having produced live performances every month for several years, the vendors paid a nominal fee when I say nominal, I mean like 25 bucks, just so that they'd have a vested interest in being present and the issue of their setting up. And then they kept all their proceeds. So just as you go forward and you think about the future, your sponsored dollars can support what you're doing and the vendors will come. I'm, and some of these vendors are gonna kill me because I said this, but, I, but, but, but uh, honestly, uh, it, at $25 a pop, they're making an investment in your organization, in your festival. It doesn't cost them anything, and they keep every dime. So if you ever run into a situation where the, where the sponsor is not paying for the vendors to be present, do know that they'll show up. But my, my second and probably bigger question is, who's managing that part of it so that other people don't just show up? Because that's what will happen, and there is currently in the Lemur Park area, a big issue with regards to vendors just vending in front of existing businesses, you know, without permits and licenses and all kinds of other things, which is causing a real difficulty for existing vendors. I'm not saying that's what you're doing. I'm just saying 
just be aware, I, 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 I've heard enough about it at this point and just having presented, I know that when they contribute towards your festival, giving you 25 bucks, they become an advocate and supporter of your festival, not just selling their goods. Exactly. I appreciate that um, <clears throat> that advice. And again, that's why for this first one, we are working with Chase and their their vendors. Um, but we also do have on our team DJ Quest Coast, who's one of the co-producers of the Lamert Park Juneteenth event. And he will be working also with that aspect when it comes to, you know, all because he's put on events that bring in, you know, 30,000 people. So he's and he's very connected in the community as well and very connected also with our local Chase branch who we're working with. So they're going to be working together and managing that and making sure that it is a cultivated group of vendors and not just kind of anyone off the street, definitely. And we do plan to, you know, barricade the area so that we're able to control who has access to you know, get in there and set up. But I do appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jimenez, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, not at this time, thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, this looks like a super exciting festival, so I have it marked on my calendar for sure to attend. Um, but on that note, I'm wondering if we have a motion to approve item B, rock the block. Um, I'll move. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Is there a second? Come on, Commissioner Jimenez, you know you want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second. <it's like> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Menes. Okay, so we'll do a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Vincent. Yes. Vote. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Yes. Commissioner Jimenez. Yes. And I also vote yes. So the motion's approved. We're very excited Thank you for your so project. Much. Yes, and yes. a wonderful presentation. And, and thank you, Whitehall, uh, Whitehall Performing Arts Academy, for all you do in the community. It it's really means a lot. Thank you, yep. appreciate it. Thank you so much. So our next item is um, item C, it's 2020 Lamart Park Jazz Festival. So uh, this is in Lamart, oh, let's see, it's Council District 8. And I think Ben Espinosa, you are also presenting this one. So happy to tee it up. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So, so the, the last one on today's uh, list for consideration is the Limerick Park Jazz Festival. I'll note this is a returning arts activation project, uh, which started off as a small community residential block party a few years ago. They've now grown and have found a new home on the upper deck of the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza, which is in fact Council District 8, uh, across a, a stone's throw away from Council District 10, from where they were at before. Uh, they're requesting $20,000 in community activation fund funding to produce a free day-long family-friendly jazz festival in South LA. It's going to take place on Saturday, August 27th, involving six major performing arts ensembles expected to reach up to 2,500 members of the community. Uh, letters of support have been submitted by the Office of Council Member Marquise Harris-Dawson of the 8th District, the Crenshaw Chamber of Commerce, and Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza Partnership. At this point, I'd like to invite the event's producer, Ms. Diane Robertson, to unmute to tell us more about the event. And I will share my screen to show your presentation. Thank you, Ben. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Diane Robertson, and as Ben mentioned, I executive produced the Lamar Park Jazz Festival, taking place on Saturday, August 27th at the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza uh, currently. I anticipate the doors will open at 11.30 a.m. and the festival will start at 12.30 p.m. and conclude at 8.30 p.m. Uh, just a little, a little background, the event has grown organically out of the Sutro Avenue Summer Soiree, an intimate block party that I began producing in the summer of 2015 on a residential street in Lamert Park. I added a jazz stage to the soiree in 2018 and 19 which was co-curated by Dwight Tribble, the executive director of the World Stage. Um, and this jazz festival is produced in collaboration with Dwight Tribble and the World Stage. The rebranded event was launched in 2020 in a virtual format due to COVID-19. And last year was the first time uh, we were able to present it in person. Uh, the Limerick Park Jazz Festival is a celebration of jazz, community, and the cultural heritage of Limerick Park, which has been the heartbeat of 
Black creative arts and culture in Los Angeles. It provides a platform to showcase and promote local music artists, visual artists, small businesses, and nonprofits. The festival is growing into a centerpiece of summer programming in South Los Angeles, and it draws an audience that is diverse in age, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomics. Uh, you can advance this slide, uh, Ben. Uh, we have, I'm sorry. Sorry, my, my computer's being yep. slow here. This year, we have a great artist lineup, um, which is being co-headlined by Patrice Russian, considered one of the world's top jazz pianists, performing the jazz classics. Our other co-headliner is still being confirmed. Uh, we also have Grammy Award winner John Beasley with his Monkestra Big Band. They do uh, reimagined works of Thelonious Monk, we have percussionist Manyango Jackson and his Jungle Jazz Band, who will be joined for a couple of tunes by members of the Lula Washington Dance Theater's Youth Dance Ensemble. Uh, we have poet and co-founder of the world stage, Kamau Daoud, with his band of griots, which is comprised of the uh, musicians Teatris Avery on sax, Kamau Kenyatta, on piano and sax, Trevor Ware on bass, and Dexter Story on drums. We also have Fernando Pullum Community Arts Center Youth Jazz Band on the lineup. And finally, Shine Mawusi, a woman's African drum circle, will be participating in a tribute we will be doing this year uh, to honor the late Barbara Morrison and the late Durf Reclaw. Um, our activations this year, you can advance the slide, um, Ben, thank you. We have, uh, oh, those are some memorable moments from, from last year. Uh, last year on the, on the lineup, we had Cy Smith, the legendary drummer, uh, Albert Tootie Heath. Uh, we had Azar Lawrence, uh, Adawe, um, Catalyst Collective, Jose Rizzo's Mangarama, who's not in that slide, and Dwight Tribble. Um, this year, we're bringing back uh, the, some of the activations we had last year, which include a community resource pavilion, a health and wellness pavilion, uh, the visual arts pavilion, which features the artwork of the winners and finalists of our uh, art competition, uh, which we which we do. Uh, it's open to South LA based visual artists 18 years and old, older, they're, they're invited to display and sell their artwork in the pavilion. And uh, it was very successful last year. Um, last year, because of COVID, we had to cancel the Kids Zone, but we're hoping to do it this year. And it will be jointly curated by local organizations, uh, LA Commons and Greetings from South LA, to uh, local arts organizations as well as Fernando Pullum Community Arts Center, who will be including a, uh, a music education uh, activity in the kids zone. We will have uh, a food truck zone with a lot of local favorites. New this year will be a Lamert Park Village Merchants Marketplace. We're inviting the retailers in the Lamert Park Village to come and join us uh, with a pop-up store uh, we will also have a wine and beer lounge, uh, which will be um, promoting uh, black and brown wine companies and microbreweries. Um, let's see. Last year, we had great feedback from the community. Here's some testimonials from Karen Mack, executive director of LA Commons. Tony Jolly, the owner of Hot and Cool Cafe, uh, a, a, a guest, you know, said a musical cultural social social event to attend annual. The festival is a sense evoking gift we all need in our lives, no less than amazing. And we had uh, great feedback from all of our uh, vendors, and and one of them here is Gorilla Grub, which is a plant based uh, food truck. Um, and then uh, we had some great press last year. Uh, LA This Week came out with, and gave us some live coverage. We had press in the LA Wave newspaper, um, uh, LA Standard newspaper, uh, some uh, 
electronic uh, publications and uh, Spectrum News actually did an interview with Dwight Tribble and myself. Uh, I think it was two or so weeks leading up to the event. And then we can go to the budget. This year's budget is estimated at $157,000. The $20,000 uh, that I am uh, applying for through the Community Arts Fund grant will pay for eight performers fees, as well as the fee for our MC and our DJ. Um, I hope you see the value in this important event in the community. Um, I believe it's well poised to become a premier jazz festival in Los Angeles and will serve to keep the community vibrant and significant for years to come. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Diane. It was a really nice presentation. I'm going to ask my other fellow commissioners if they have any questions or comments. Uh, Commissioner Jefferson, do you have any questions? Um, the, the comment I made before with regards to vendors, again, is just a, sort of the same thing. As we have the nonprofit entities coming in to put on the art and culture and bringing in business vendors with them, which make it fabulous by the way i've been to this festival and it is fabulous uh, thank you I look forward to it all the time uh even with this even with my sweatshirt um <laughs> but i but i just i just raise that again as we continue to build this up or maybe we have conversations with the department of business here in the city and see whether or not we can get the department of business to also begin to think about putting dollars into this so that it's supporting business entrepreneurs who are not nonprofits so that our nonprofits can spend even more money paying artists and others, which always was a concern as we were doing these festivals, um, et cetera. And, 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 and then just, just lastly, I'm just glad it's happening. I, was, I would have thought you guys were otherwise eligible outside of this, but this is dollars well spent for this festival. And the new venue works really well. Yeah, and you know, I know it's a, it may appear a bit wonky that the Lamar Park Jazz Festival isn't properly in Lamar Park, but it's- oh, Please, it's around the corner, it doesn't matter. It's around the corner, and which is why I am uh, attempting to create a much stronger nexus between the festival and the Lamar Park Village merchants by, creating this Limerick Park Village Merchants Marketplace. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, Commissioner Vincent, do you have any questions or comments? I love anything that celebrates Los Angeles's rich jazz history and amazing musicians. Um, it reminds me of yet another um, wonderful event that was Jazz Caravan in which um, buses <clears throat> went basically northeast, south, and west, and Limerick Park was one of the, the major hubs. Um, but you could go, you could explore jazz um, in Universal City at an old place called Dante's that was wonderful, um, that is that has gone. And um, I think that, that it's gonna be a wonderful uh, celebration of Los Angeles talent, and I cannot wait to go. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Vincent. Commissioner Jimenez, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, no, it just, it seems like a really special event. And it's, um, you know, jazz is, is such a kind of amazing genre of music, and it's great to keep it contemporary and alive and expose, to, expose all generations to it. So it sounds uh, great, yeah. Yeah, and I also am really excited for this festival. I think I missed the, it was last year, correct, Diana? Yes, that's and correct. then And then it was on hold the year before, and then, yeah. Right, it, right. Yeah, so, it, yeah, we're all looking forward to this, and I think um, this is a great, it's a great way to use city funding, so it's we're awesome. all excited. So, um, on that note, do we have a motion to approve I move to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Vincent. Do we have a second? second. Thank second. you, Commissioner Jefferson. So we'll do a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Jimenez, how do you vote? Yes. Great. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Commissioner Vincent? Yes. 
And I also vote yes, Commissioner Scrifano. So congratulations. This, we're all looking forward to these. All three of these events are going to be pretty fabulous. And I think thank well you, needed. <laughs> Great. So thank you so much. Um, I have a, a, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, is there any kind of um, a device so that um, we would get invitations to all these events? Um, because, um, I mean, aside from putting them on our, our calendar, um, in the previous commission that I was on, it was like a kind of a regular thing. And I know we're not meeting in person yet, um, but it would be really wonderful to make sure that we we're able to experience these. Can, uh, Daniel, can you answer that? Absolutely. Um, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. I want, I'd love to figure out a way to do it. Um, as you know, we're operating without a commission executive assistant right now, who would be the key person that would be able to help us with that. So what we'll do is, um, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to talk to you offline to hear a little bit more about how, how El Pueblo did it. Um, so I can understand that. And then we can look at what system we could set up here. Thank yeah, you. that would be great. Because then it's really nice to attend to all of these events. So for us, I think, as commissioners. So on that note, do we want to move on to the next item, architectural submissions, which um, is the 6th Street Park Cafe office and restroom buildings. This is located um, on South Santa Fe Avenue and South Anderson. Um, we have seen this project before. It came before our commission and uh, we approved it for conceptual, but not final. So uh, this, um, they were requesting final approval. And um, the architect uh, is Michael Malton and Paul Stodling, I think from Michael Malton's office will be presenting, is that correct? Um, That's correct. One, super. Okay, so we're looking forward to this presentation. So, Paul, are you here? Can you? I I'm see here. you on the can screen. You hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but not see you. But oh, well, Commissioner pa pa Paul, before you before you start, um, Commissioner Scrifano, I'd like to just ask our staff architect to just give an overview real quick before. Um, before uh, Paul begins. Yes, thank you so much, Tammy. I'm so sorry about that. So Tammy, Sam, our uh, DCA staff architect will present the project. So why don't you go ahead, Tammy? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, hi, commissioners. So this project has uh, come before you uh, on October of last year. As a refresher, the Sixth Street Park provides a new public amenity to the art district. Uh, Boyle Heights and the greater LA area. Uh, this project is going to be introducing three new buildings that will provide public restrooms, offices, a concession stand, and a standalone cafe. Uh, the commission has asked for more information on the context, so the applicant has provided a landscaping uh, planting palette for um, for your reference. So the staff recommendation is for final approval for this project. Paul, can you please unmute yourself and present your project? Yes, and are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, great, I'll share my screen. So good afternoon. My name is Paul Stolting. I'm with Michael Malton Architecture, and thank you, Tammy, for the summary. We're returning for final approval, and we have some additional information on the park context. And I also have with me Megan Esopenko from Hargraves Jones, who's doing the landscape design, to speak in a little bit more detail about the trees and planting in the park. So jump into it. Um, as is noted, the Buildings that we're reviewing are located in the park, which is located beneath the 6th Street Viaduct. So something we're uh, looking forward to seeing completed this summer, actually. And underneath the viaduct, there's a park which extends from uh, Mateo Street on the west all the way over to the 101 freeway on the east. The buildings are located uh, on each side of the park. When I see each side, I mean basically each side of the LA River. So on the west side, there's a cafe building and restroom building. 
and the east side there's a restroom and a staff building for Department of Rec and Parks um, maintenance. The two views, we'll look at these a little bit closer later on. And Megan, I don't know if you're connected. I know you're having some trouble. Are you? Hi. Can um, you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Megan Estepenko. I'm with Cargrace Jones. We're the landscape architects on this project. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the tree palette that we've selected. Uh, the trees are based on a thorough sun and shade analysis that we did. Um, because we're underneath a bridge, uh, we have a lot of um, sun and shade conditions we need to think about. And we categorize them into three different categories. Uh, we have the drifts, the edges, and the accents. And the drifts are a variety of different species that provide different textures and colors throughout the park. We tried to use some large fast growing trees such as gums um, to give the, the project some height and to make them in relationship to the, to the scale of the bridge. Uh, the next category is the edges and these are along the main pathways that run along the south um, and north. Forgive me for one second. Um, I, I just want to um, clarify something. Um, mm -hmm. How mature, we're looking at very mature trees here right. in, in, in all of the cases. How mature will the trees that are going to be planted, how tall will they be roughly? Um, they, they're going by box size and uh, we're, we're planting 24 by 24 to 48 inch box. So they will probably start out at six to 10 feet tall, maybe. So they, they're going to need to be established and um, <laughs> they, they won't be this tall when they're planted, but that's for sure. So basically starting out the drifts, edges, and accent trees are all going to be about the same size? Yeah, the accents will be smaller. Those are more the 24-inch box. Um, we've, we've tried to spec as large as we can for the bigger ones, like the drifts and the edges that we want to have a presence um, on the day, on the opening day. But 48 is the maximum size that we, we are going with. This and I'm sorry, I don't want to belabor the point. I just have one other question with regard to the trees um, and actually all the planting. Um, uh, typically, um, what percent of the trees don't make it past five years? And what is uh, what happens in the event that uh, a tree doesn't make it? Is there is it part of the contract to have it replaced or is it the city's problem or what's the deal? Not to interrupt, but maybe we can let Megan finish her presentation and then we can ask the questions afterwards. Okay. Is that All okay? Right. Megan, maybe you can proceed. Yeah, whichever. Um, whenever you yeah, I think that's to. easier um, than we can take notes and ask questions after. If that's okay, Commissioner Vincent. Sure. Okay. Go ahead, Megan. Okay. So like uh, saying that we have these edges um, these are along the main pathways so we've chosen a, a more substantial tree tree canopy tree um, to provide shade and comfort along these these spaces where there's benches and a lot of walkways and then the third category is these accent trees and these are punctuated within the gardens uh, along the park project and they have a lot of different um, seasonal interests with color and texture and different Different flowers um, that complement the garden, the garden planting. Um, I can't hear anything. Yeah, I think she froze. Um, that may also be the end of the landscape presentation. Okay, so, uh, Paul, the, uh, are, we're, is that the end of the landscape presentation or? It is, it's, it's the, the, the one slide we have for landscape and tree pile. Yeah. Okay, do you wanna proceed and then we can ask questions yeah. after, thank you. Sounds good. Okay, we'll get into the buildings. We'll start at the West Park. Um, these are located off of Santa Fe Avenue. Uh, again, there's two, um, Clearly, these are elliptical in shape. Uh, and this is part of a motif um, that the rest of the park landscape shares. So everything is elliptical and oval shaped. Uh, the larger of the two buildings is 
the cafe and the smaller is the restrooms nearby. So have several slides of these. So in a little bit more detail, the plans, uh, these are located beneath uh, what we uh, are calling the west abutment of the viaduct. So the viaduct comes overhead and it ends uh, here and continues over to Mateo Street. The cafe uh, is one single room with a small kiosk for serving uh, coffees, prepackaged foods. Um, the restrooms have um, restrooms, a utility space, and then it's also house uh, the West Park electrical distribution box. A few other things we'll point out. These shapes are columns for the viaduct overhead. And then we have a little bit more information on some of the light fixtures. You can see that better in the slides ahead. On the elevations of the cafe building, you'll see we have uh, curved walls and some interesting shaped windows. And on the restroom building, there are no windows, it's just doors. Uh, the material is uh, cement stucco, so it's a very hard, uh, resilient material, and it will be painted a bright yellow. Um, painting will uh, allow maintenance to cover up any imperfections or damage or um, markings that the buildings may take. So instead of integral, it will be uh, easy to maintain. And in terms of other materials, the windows will be aluminum framed and interiors will be painted white and will have concrete floors. Here are some sections showing how the spaces work. Again, wide open space in the cafe, uh, restrooms and the electrical distribution box in uh, the smaller of the two buildings. And you can also see the viaduct overhead. And one more note, have in reference for scale is one of the fixtures that eliminate the area. We'll see that a little bit more in the next slide. So zooming in on this 3D view, we can see the dashed line of the viaduct overhead. Uh, there's a little bit of lighting uh, on the underside of the viaduct that illuminates the street and the sidewalk in front of these buildings. The rest of the lighting is covered by these pole fixtures with um, kind of an adjustable lamp on the top. So there are the four to six lamps per uh, pole. So these actually give quite a bit of coverage um, in a very customizable area. The furniture is here for scale reference. Um, the operator of the cafe will of course provide the furniture for the seating. And then uh, really last but not least, the context, the immediate context of the buildings uh, will have uh, a paint as well on the ground and on the back of the abutment. So really this yellow uh, it will pop up in a few locations in the park and provide some wayfinding and uh, a unique um, bright space uh, underneath these lower portions. And then some older context photos. Construction actually is, is quite busy over here. It's very dense. And uh, the existing context uh, is, is emerging more and more every day. So this is the location of the cafe building. You can see the two columns up in front and then a little bit further in back is the restroom building. The view uh, at the bottom is just across the street from both of these. So here we'll see the viaduct extending over across the LA River. on some East Park buildings. And again, we'll see some more zoomed in versions of these graphics, but the East Park buildings are off of South Anderson Street. So there's uh, parking, notably along Anderson. And it's very near some of the sports courts. So you can see the outline of the basketball court over here. Um, this is one of the columns that supports the viaduct overhead. And you can see a little bit from the dashed lines where the viaduct runs. So it really covers most of this building. Um, it's two buildings kind of combined by a little bit of an, a, a bridge, which creates a passageway, kind of a gateway to the sports courts from the parking and entrance along Anderson Street. 
There are offices, restrooms, uh, kitchen for Rec and Park staff. The yellow program over here is meant to be a, a concession stand. And then on the other side is two storage spaces and then the public restrooms. You can see also that this is the location where the sinks uh, and water fountains are located. In the bridge space between these two buildings, we have uh, overhead lighting, soffit lighting. And uh, there will also be a uh, sort of a linear cove light over each of the sink and water fountain locations. So again, we're painting the building yellow. It'll be a hard uh, cement plaster. Actually, in fact, this one's going to be concrete. This one's a little bit more um, slightly different method of construction. But the concrete's going to be mm -hmm. painted, correct? That's correct. Yes, yes. Okay. painted yellow. Uh, again, the concession stand, offices, and then cutting a little bit further through the bridge location, you can see the height of this uh, over the ground below. And then over in profile, uh, one of the pole fixtures at this side of the park. This fixture is a little bit different from what we saw on the west side. Uh, this has a much broader coverage, the taller fixture uh, and illuminates a much larger area. Here's some context photos. And this is much earlier before the viaduct was under construction. So this location right here would be the location of the building with the viaduct overhead. And then across the street again is, is simply what you'd see from the building. So the park continues uh, all the way as far as the 101 freeway. And that is my last slide. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Megan, uh, for your presentation. Um, I just want to note that that we are reviewing this for final approval, and it is the for the cafe, office, and restroom building. So um, I open up the floor to my fellow commissioners to see if they have any questions or comments. Commissioner Jefferson, do you have any questions? Uh, one, thank you for um, all of the extra effort that you brought back to us to take a look at. It's much appreciated. I'm probably um, a little lost as to where the bridge is relative to the park. Like, is it at, is it uh, over? Is it sitting on top of those pylons? You can't see me pointing. In the bottom left corner, are those pylons and that's the bridge on top of it? That's right. Yeah, right. You okay. See a slightly lighter shade. Yeah, we had to ghost it so we could see. Right. What's below. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I was just trying to get my bearings on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I I like that the fact that you gave it color and what you're trying to do with the trees and the plantings and 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 I kind of share uh, Commissioner Vincent's sort of question around um, just making sure that there's a fund to replace trees that don't make it you know, in those first plantings so that when everybody's gone, they somebody puts an extra effort to get the trees in that didn't make it the first time. <clears throat> but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Vincent, I know you have some questions. Um, the first one is we're, we're approving the buildings. We're also we're approving the landscaping. No, I think no. it's just the buildings. I think they included that. Um, uh, Daniel, maybe you can clarify that. I think they included the landscaping as for our reference. Is that correct? Correct. The, the landscaping was included um, as a slide for reference um, to follow up on the questions that you had uh, when it came forward with uh, for conceptual approval. Okay. Um, I, I think it's it's wonderfully it, it, wonderful project. It's it's kind of whimsical. I love the shape of the buildings, um, and the window cutouts, um, and the boldness in color. And um, it's going to make a fine addition to the bridge. 
Thank you, Commissioner Vincent. Commissioner Jimenez, do you have any questions or comments? Um, no, other than just I appreciate the creativity behind it and kind of the the lightheartedness and, and uh, how it really kind of pops and it, it is very fun. And as my fellow commissioner said, like uh, like whimsical. So I, I, I like it. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to comment. I, I love the I love the design because it's so sort of fun to have something that's not a rectilinear shape and the color is really great. And Paul, I want to thank your team for also, you know, allowing these buildings to not be an integral structure, but to so that they can be painted because, you know, that also we can, they can be maintained much easier. So, and I appreciate your team also bringing, you know, we had a lot of questions last time and it seems like you guys addressed all of our questions and concerns. And I want to thank you for that. So on that note, is there a motion to approve the Sixth Street Park Cafe office and restroom building? I move to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Vincent. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner um, Jimenez. We'll take a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Jefferson, how do you vote? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. <laughs> Commissioner Jimenez. Yes. Commissioner Vincent. Yes. And I also, Commissioner Scafrano, vote yes. So thank you very much. Item has been approved. Thank and you. we're looking forward to seeing this this summer. Absolutely. So, thank you. And thank you for all the feedback. Yep. Great. I, I, and I, I just want to add in again thank you for giving us the context because what you've decided around us lets us know that there's more there to help the building live and be and pop and and is it the context is everything so thank you great thank you great so the uh next item i might have a i don't know if this printed correctly but um oh sorry next item is street light presentation so uh Sorry, there's one um, AGF. One AGF. Okay, how do I somehow? I apologize. I printed it's on, everything. It's on the top of page five. It says CAO. Oh, got it. I still thought that was part of the other item. I apologize. Okay, so the next item before us is um, item B, which is CA002 Los Angeles Crenshaw. I assume this is an AGF. And uh, this is for conceptual and final, and the architect is Pinnacle Design Group. So, Tammy, will you be introducing the project? Um, no, they will. Uh, Karina, okay. could you please um, unmute yourself and present your project? Thank you, Karina. Hi, uh, this is Karina Arvizu with Qualtech Wireless. I'm um, an agent for Verizon Wireless, and we are um, here to ask for approval of an above ground meter pedestal um, that will power a AGF, um, sorry, a small cell installation on a JPA pole. Okay, can you please share your screen so you can present your AGF? Um, I, I can share my screen here. Are you on a phone? I'm a, I'm on the phone. I'm also on mm. watching the YouTube. Oh, go ahead and present. Thank you, Scott. Can everybody see that? Yeah, we, we can see it. Karina, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, do you want to present the project? 
Sure. Um, so we are using an, an existing JPA poll um, for the small cell installation, and the meter pedestal um, will be rep will be around the corner. Um, it'll actually be sort of hidden behind some palms that are in the park on the parkway there. Um, do we have the photo film? I think it's harder to see on the plan. Okay. Not the last slide. Oh, maybe the photo films aren't. Is the photo that you're referring to on a uh, separate slide, or is it the image of the final on the last page of the application that you submitted? Um, we sub yeah, we submitted. Um photo sims for it, uh, which actually showed there's there's actually um, some palms there in the parkway, which aren't on the drawings. Um, I don't I don't see them in the slide. Tammy, are you able to are you able to to pull that up from the information that was submitted? I am having some computer issues. Um, I'm spread over two computers right now, so I can't actually access the files. Um, so unfortunately I cannot share um, my screen, um, but there should be some photo sims in the project file because it all comes as one application in one PDF. Karina, do you think you could uh, get to a computer and share your screen? Maybe we'll come back to you. That's what I was going to um, suggest. Okay. And how, how <clears throat> would I get access? Is it the same? Uh, is it the YouTube link there? No, you, so the, you'll, on you'll sign into uh, Zoom. So when you go to the agenda, the meeting ID is there. Um, I'm, I'm going to be sending you an email. I'm sorry, I'm sorry okay. Tammy, the link is not on the agenda, so you'll have to send your calendar invite or send her directly by email for the Zoom link. Okay, I'll do that. Um, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll come back to you, Karina. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this item number B, but the next item is the streetlight presentation. So. Um, I think, Tammy, you were going to introduce, I think Richard is his name from <clears throat> Bureau of Street Lighting. Yes, uh, Richard from Bureau of Street Lighting is here with us. He's going to do a presentation, but before he starts, I want to explain uh, the packages as the commissioners, you guys receive it. So you'll see that each uh, application is comprised of three parts. There's attachment A, B, and C. A is the cover sheet, it has the project data. Um, and then attachment B has the photo key map and also the street light key map. And attachment C's are the corresponding uh, photos. Um, and Richard, uh, could you please present? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Richard Sargumba. Um, you know, Tammy uh, reached out to me a few weeks ago uh, and asked me to give a little brief overview of uh, BSL. My apologies, I don't have any, uh, any slides prepared, but just, I'll just give you a little brief uh, overview. So the, the Bureau of Street Lighting has about 223,000 lights within the, the city of LA. Uh, those lights cover about two thirds of the roads within the city. Um, the, the, the main uh, objective of BSL you know, is, uh, is to promote public safety, you know, to increase public safety. And the secondary goal is to uh, aid and assist with uh, transportation within the city of LA. Uh, just to let you know, um, our uh, maintenance group 
uh, they they answer about 45,000 streetlight out requests or outages every year. And um, with that with that many requests, uh, our budget is at 42 million for the year and it's been frozen, uh, I believe for about 20 years at 42 million. So we've been doing a lot with, with less every year due to inflation and everything else. Uh, when when uh, Tammy uh, first came, uh, uh, reached out to me, she had a couple of questions that you commissioners had. Um, so one of them was, um, how do you decide what lights go where? And when I talked to Tammy about it, I told her that you know the, the, the short answer is that um, when a B permit comes in and it's like a private developer and they're just doing one light, you know, we ask them to match the existing, uh, whatever is adjacent on that street. Um, we want them to, uh, to look on our approved list, which is on our website and to select a light that's within the same category as the lights on that street. Um, that's, that's pretty much how it goes. And the other question that, that uh, Tammy had asked was how do new poles and luminaires get introduced to the city? Now, Normally, what happens if, if uh, the way a new pole or luminaire gets introduced is when there's a big project, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, at the airports or a, a metro project, or it could be a private developer that uh, you know is doing like a big block or, or a big apartment or whatever, they uh, sometimes will want to uh, make their project stand out, uh, you know, uh, visually. And one of the, one of the things that that they like to do is maybe introduce a new color or a new light, um, light fixture or a pole. Um, and that's, I would say 99% of the way that uh, the new poles get uh, introduced to the city. Um, another way, which is uh, really the first time that I know of, I don't know if you're aware of the Super Bloom, that was a, a contest that the mayor and our director at the time uh, conducted to have uh, a new, uh, I guess, signature city pole be introduced. Um, and uh, Super Bloom was the winner. I think they were, I think the, uh, the designer was in uh, Project Room, I believe. Uh, but again, we're still in the process. Now, now they won and conceptually um, they, they have an idea of what, of, of what the poll uh, should be, but now it's reality. And so when, when the design came to, to my group, you know, we're tasked with actually trying to find people that can actually make that poll at a reasonable price. So we're still in that stage right now. Um, and I don't know, uh, though that's really my, my short presentation. I can answer any questions uh, that you have, uh, commissioners. Uh, thank you, Richard. I'll open up the floor to the fellow commissioners if there are any questions. Uh, Commissioner Vincent, do you have any questions or comments? Um, question, just out of curiosity. Um, Street poles in Los Angeles, especially in the 30s and 40s, I mean, they were little works of art onto themselves. How did they evolve from that into basic tubes <laughs> with an LED at the end? Well, you know, you know all the decorative uh, poles, we, you know, our, our maintenance guys, they really, really like those uh, decorative poles. And uh, even though, um, they, they don't make them the way they used to. We still try to keep the outside look of it. Um, internally, uh, we've, we've changed the way it's made to make them more modernized, but there's still, there's still plenty of them around and they're still being installed. But the, the, the reason why you see more of the tubes is that they're just less expensive. Um, you know, a typical- so It was expense that moved it from decorative to more functional. I'm almost positive that's the reason, yeah. Plus, a lot of people don't make it anymore. You know, a lot of the companies right now, I don't know if you know, there's only one concrete manufacturer approved for the city. All the other ones that used to be approved, they all went out of business. And mm -hmm. I, I've been trying to find another concrete manufacturer. We had one lined up in Arizona, but then they went under. We're working with a company that's based on Nebraska. The problem is the shipping from Nebraska to here just kind of blows up their, their uh, profit margin. So right now, the only one that, that uh, that's approved for concrete is up in uh, 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 north of Ox or south of Oxnard, mm -hmm. yeah, Amron. Okay. Oh, interesting. Uh, Commissioner Jefferson, do you have any questions or comments? And thank you, Richard, and thank you, DCA, for you know coming before us because I know we have a lot of questions on street lights, and it's great uh, um, to have someone. 
Yeah, I, I appreciate your coming forward too. I think that what part of what we're what we're trying to get our hands around is what is the long term visual look that the city is seeking to adopt so that the goal would be less about matching the existing light and more about going to whatever the aesthetic is supposed to be that, that the city has decided on in terms of what their lights are gonna look like. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and it kind of flips back and forth. I and mean, even in, in, the, in the presentation that we didn't finish seeing, but that was right, gonna be right there with us without looking at the neighborhood or understanding what it is, we, we know what an AGF is in a box. What we don't know is what it's gonna look like in the context of the neighborhood. So I think that the ongoing question we were, we've been having has been, on one hand, when someone comes to us and says they wanna put up a light pole, and someone says it's going to match the existing lights. We just need to be reminded what the existing light is in the neighborhood and see it, and then it's easy. But on the other hand, is the comprehensive conversation around what is the city ultimately going for? Is there an aesthetic look here, or is there a clean, disappear kind of approach that we're trying to take? And if that's the case, then maybe there's a point when the city sits down, has a decision about the clean, disappear approach of the lights, and that the goal will be one day, all the lights are like that because the aesthetic is being put into something else. Otherwise, we're just all over the place. And if I hear you say that some of the manufacturers of the lights are out of business, if someone goes to put up a light in an area that has a historic light, what does that mean? They're, they don't have to put it up because the people who make those lights are out of business or do they get them custom manufactured? Well, um, to answer your first question, um, you know, is there a, uh, is there like an overall aesthetic plan for the city of LA? That's above my pay grade. I, I can't, I can't answer that question. Um, but I just know from experience, um, and I've worked for the, for Sri Lanka for like 30, 31 years. So I just noticed that every little, every area, you know, the neighborhood commission or whatever they, a lot of times they want to have their own unique look, which is why um, there's no there's no consistent look throughout the city, because uh, you know depending on how 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 much they want it, right? They'll, they'll ask for uh, they'll ask for anything that makes that makes their neighborhood stand out or just to differentiate themselves from other places. Uh, now your other question about what happens uh, when a uh, a manufacturer, um, you know, some of these lights were were were. Uh, manufactured in you know early 1900s or whatever right and yeah a lot of those a lot of those companies are gone uh, and the manufacturing process that they did and the materials they used uh, were old and inefficient right so uh, we we have experience with with fabricating replica um, and um, our the, the guys the guys that do the maintenance on these I mean they a lot of them you know they appreciate the old the old uh, the old poles the decorative bases and the decorative arms. And um, re really, they, they really want to keep and maintain that look in those parts of the city that have it, you know? So yeah, we, we, it's, a, it's a, a, a big priority for us to keep that look in certain areas. And, you know, if people want to pay the price, you know, they can get the decorative stuff uh, in, in another area that's, uh, you know, it's being built up or in, in new development, but it's going to cost more just because, you know, those are very decorative, you know? Okay. Um, Commissioner Jimenez, do you have any questions? Or Commissioner Jefferson, did you have more questions or comments? No, I, l let me hear what everybody else has to say first. Um, no, no comments, thank you. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Richard. So, is I guess it's going back to Commissioner Jefferson's question, like is, I guess what we're asking for is, is there sort of a vision moving forward? Because obviously there's the old historic lights, then there's the concrete lights, right? That you talked about, and those are made in Idaho or wherever. Oh, yeah. and, and then there's the metal lights. I just have a question, which one is, is the most modern and cost effective? Because Oops, my phone's ringing, sorry. 
Do you uh, have a sense well, of? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, um, the, the things you described are the poles, right? So not they're not the lights, but the yeah. lights, the poles. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, uh, and really, the answer is, uh, I mean, it's. I think the the, uh, the the steel tubes the least they're the least expensive, right? So if a project wants to come in and the lighting is not a priority for them, uh, you know, they're allowed they're they're gonna they're gonna put the steel poles in the tubes, right? Or if it, it could be concrete as well, depending on what's adjacent. If if they're not, uh, they if they don't they don't care necessarily. But if aesthetics is important, um, you know, to the to the uh, um, project manager to the designer, um, then then yeah, there, there's definitely. I mean, the decorative decorative poles are not off the table for them. But again, these things they cost a lot more. I mean, a I don't, I'm just doing generalities here, but a, a but a steel pole is like three thousand dollars versus a decorative pole just could be anywhere fifteen to twenty thousand. You know, I mean, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Okay, so I guess what we're hoping for is there is some consistency. I actually prefer the metal poles. I think they're cleaner, they're more modern. If they right. are the least, but you know, our concern as a commission is is definitely aesthetics and then cost second. So I think um, you know, if you do have any insight in the future that you can share with us, I think it'd be important. I mean, how how do the other commissioners feel? I mean, it would be great to see if there is a new poll um, and the one that you talked about, I guess it's not ready for primetime viewing, but, um, you know, for us, it's more the aesthetics and consistency, I think, within the city, m more than I would say costs, wouldn't you say, Commissioner Jefferson, or do you have yeah, any? Yeah, I, 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 I think what I'm trying to get at is <clears throat> if a neighborhood has been declared a historic preservation zone and therefore the houses and some other things about that area are intended to preserve a particular kind of of uh, of of aesthetic or variation in an aesthetic or time period etc then i would assume that the lights that are going into that area should in fact support the approach that is within that concept or that that area that has now got its HPOZ. If, if we're rebuilding parts of downtown and dropping in all those box apartments that we're dropping in all over the place that, that look like they are storage lockers stacked on top of each other, then, then everybody should be going after the sleekest light with the solar on it that's most efficient, that's going to work. There then isn't 29 AGFs that come along and are going to plop on that pole because the look we're going for is that sleek, slim, less intrusive into the skyline look. And the aesthetic is coming from somewhere else. So every time we say, and then the only other pole that's got something on it is because it's a street sign or a traffic signal. And every time we, we go along and say yes to a poll and someone else comes along and says, I'd like to put my ugly box on it, and five ugly boxes are allowed in a, in a block, what happens is we've just blown open whatever the look of our city is that we're trying to have. And, and we're not clear as much where the historic looks are versus the so-and-so looks, et cetera. So on one hand, it's matched the existing street lighting if the existing street light in front of my house is a salt and pepper concrete, I think it's concrete pole, right? So if someone wanted to come along and put another street light in, I would expect that all of them should be like that on this block. Instead, you got all kinds of things going on. And just because someone wants to put in one thing has nothing to do with what is the neighborhood trying to do. And so it just feels like, and this, please uh, understand, <clears throat> this is not a comment to you. It's just part of the reason we were asking to have someone come and talk with us and figure this out is because we're looking for a way to have some 
consistency and approach that makes it easier for the staff when they're doing the review, that makes it easier for us. Because of course we can say yes to a light pole if it works. But yes. if at the end of the day, we've never had a conversation around what is the neighborhood trying to do? We, we just, it's just an exercise. So, so maybe I could suggest, Richard, you kind of have heard our comments and our questions. Maybe you can kind of come back to us with some answers. Would that be helpful? Um, you know? So the question you have is, is there an overall, uh, uh, an overall plan for the whole city? Uh, I can ask, but I'm, I mean, other than, you know, you know, we're, we're looking to, you know, our point of view, it's about cost, right? Because like I said, our, our budget's been frozen for like 20 years. Uh, thankfully, because of LEDs, they've come in and they, we've been able to, to cut our electricity bill by, I don't know, 60% over the last 10, 15 years or whatever. So um, we've been able to, to, to survive basically. Um, and for us, cost is always number one um, for electricity, right? But for the pole and, uh, you know, the, the pole and stuff like that, for sure, we want to match what's what's in the neighborhood. I mean, yeah, if, if you have a concrete pole in front of your house, um, we're going to put a concrete pole if it gets torn down. I mean, that's, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, now, even within your commission, right? You, you like the sleep, someone else like the uh, the old style or whatever. I mean, there, it's, it would be hard to have a uniform idea for the whole city if even within the commission, <laughs> there's, a, there's a preference difference, right? Well, so. well, maybe you can ask someone in your department uh -huh. if there if there is a plan, because okay. that's sort of what we were asking. And then I guess who who pays for the new streetlight? Also, is that the city, or I'm just curious. Well, if it's a B permit, it'll be the it'll be the the contractor or whoever's doing the B permit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and you know. We have assessments for the maintenance, and, and you know, if a, if a pole gets knocked down, you know, that's on that's on the assessment fund to take care of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think you know, I think you've heard our concerns, and sort of, you know, we yep. just wanted some insight from you. So maybe you can yep. go back and see if there are any answers to this question, to our questions, and. You know, hopefully we'll see you again. Okay. I'll, I think I'll, uh, we probably should move on to okay. I'll, our next I'll, uh, item. Yeah. I'll contact <laughs> you. I'll, I'll uh, contact uh, Tammy and let her know if I find anything. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you sure. for coming. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. So um, should we, uh, Tammy and... Um, Anyone from DCA, do we have the photos from Karina or should we move on to streetlights? Hi, <clears throat> Karina. Do you have I, um, Yeah, I, I can I can share now. Okay. So just for the record, we're going back to item B, which is under the architectural submission, CA002, um, Los Angeles Crenshaw AGF. So Karina, if you can present to us quickly, that would be great. Okay, can everyone see? Yes. Okay, so here, this is uh, the meter pedestal that we're proposing. And as you can see, it's um, right next to some existing landscaping that'll be maintained. And it's also, um, there's no windows or any doorways um, right adjacent to it. And it's outside of um, pedestrian traffic. And it'll it'll be similar color to existing boxes and infrastructure on that street. The, the basic grayish white tone. Okay, great. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask my fellow commissioners if they have any questions or comments. One, is this a residential block? And two, could you describe and let me know a little bit more about what the what that is on the front of that box? Um, this is, uh, so this is an electrical meter pedestal. The um, 
power company does not provide power to the JPA pole for um, which this is powering. So um, in, in most installations, we will try and get a handhole placed for power. Um, in this case, that can't be done um, because the power company won't provide it um, onto, the, onto, the, onto a handhole or onto the existing pole. So we need to have a meter pedestal. So this is similar to what you have at home. Um, you know, what, what uh, they look at to, to meter your, how much power you're using. That's, that's all that's in there, the power connection. So can I just ask um, Commissioner Scarfano, maybe you can help me with this. Is, is there something about this box that's different than the other AGF boxes that we get? Because it sounds like what I'm seeing is saying, hearing is that there's a window in which one can read the, me the meter yes. on the front of this box. Yeah, it looks to me, I, I, I think you're correct in that assumption, Commissioner Jefferson. And what else is on the front of this box? We went through a lot of trouble of not wanting to have these boxes turn into uh, advertising pieces with one of our previous presenters. So I'm just trying yeah. to. Uh, yeah, that's all it is. There is, there is nothing else. Uh, there might be a, a tag that the power company uses um, to put like an address identifier on it, but that's it. So there's no advertising or no any graphics on this box. None at all. Is that what you're asking, Commissioner Jefferson? Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure that tag has some writing on it, and and I think what we asked the others to do was whether or not they could could whether that tag could be somewhere where it was less front facing and, you know, et cetera, whether it was on the bottom side or on the back or something that wasn't. Um, question, yeah. um, is the tag an identification just, you said address tag, or is it a tag advertising the manufacturer of the box? Uh, no, that would be an address tag and it's for the power company that comes to read it. I see, okay, thank you. It's just to identify what box they're they're reading. Perfect, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, this I think is the first time we've actually yeah, seen a box that looks like this. Yeah, so. me too. We've never had one like this. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, when we when we are uh, proposing AGF, it'll be an uh, equipment for the for the cell sites. Um, this is small cell, so there's the equipment on the pole. And, okay, so uh, but we're not seeing the pole. Yeah, uh, well, the, the pole is JPA, and the, the um, that part it has already been approved, actually. So this is, uh, that's what that looks like. It's an existing utility pole. We're placing arms, and you can see the meter pedestal is just around the corner there. So I have a question. We're approving the meter pedestal and the addition to the pole? Is the, No, is just the meter pedestal just the meter pedestal. Yeah, uh, JPA falls outside of um, AGF. Uh, sorry, uh, JPA is uh, the <laughs> Joint Pole Authority. It's uh, for utility poles. Okay, uh, Commissioner Jimenez, do you have any questions? Not at this time, thank you. Okay. Um, hmm. <laughs> Uh, the a problem I have with this box, Karina, is you've got a photo, but we can't really tell what it looks like. Um, can you zoom in on that photo? I mean, it's really hard to tell. Am I? Is anyone else feeling the same? I'm right there with you. Yeah. So, yeah, you've probably seen this box a million times. Um, no, we haven't. No, this... we've seen a million boxes, but not one like <laughs> yeah. that. That one that looks like it has an. Eyeball. It's a it's a it's a Myers meter pedestal. I can I can tell you there's there's a ton of them out there, uh, especially in city of LA. Uh, we're not we're not the only ones that use them. It's actually also used by um, the city for street lighting and all sorts of other things. Okay, but I I think what I'm hearing, if if I can maybe summarize it is that 
I don't think a box like this has come before the commission that I've been on in the last, I don't know, four years. Um, yeah, it's been a while since a, I brought one to you. And yeah, I've and been I, on it longer than that. And, and I've never had one that looked like I had a tiny TV screen in the front of yeah. it. <laughs> so um, I guess the question is, do we want to make a motion for them to come back and show us more detail of what this looks like? Because I, I mean, we, we could do a, a Google search right now and find find quite a few of these out there, maybe some live ones. Uh, that's not. Yeah. Yeah, we have to, I think. Yeah. So, Commissioner Vincent, do you have a suggestion or? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you. I, I suggest that um, that we move on with some more detailed current photographs of each side of the box. Yeah, since it's a new box that has not been shown to us before. So maybe we can ask for a motion. I guess that would be a motion, Commissioner Vincent, to um, have them come back. Is Yes, with more detailed photographs. Do we okay. have a second? Second. Were you going to say something, Commissioner Vincent? I was just going to say uh, if they could be a better quality, too, because um, as we zoom in on these, you can see how fuzzy it gets, how pixelated it gets. Agree. Okay, so we'll take a quick vote. We have, um, so uh, Commissioner Jimenez, how do you vote? The, the motion before is that they'll come back to us with more information on what the box looks like. Um, okay, yes to that, thank you. Thank you, okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes. Commissioner Vincent. Yes. And I also vote yes. So I think we're going to move on to the next item, which is streetlight submission. Um, so that, uh, I'm sorry, so to conclude the last, um, we'll hopefully see you again soon, Karina, with more information on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so street light submission. These are action and consent items. Uh, the first item is matching street lights. We have A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, which are all matching street lights. So, Tammy, can you uh, present to us? And I think we could take these all as one vote, correct? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, so these are matching street lights. If you look in your package. Um, you will see that it's uh, each application is comprised of three parts. So app, attachment A, which is a cover sheet that has the information of what type of street lights are being proposed, what are to be relocated, and what are to be removed. Um, and it is staff recommendation that these be approved. Okay, so these are uh, street light. They're all the same street light, correct, Tammy? That's that's nine five three C. Right. So these are the ones that are matching. So it matches the other street lights in the neighborhoods. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we can take all these as one item. Is are there any questions or comments, or do we have a motion to approve? Would it be helpful uh, if we brought them up? on the screen for everybody to see, to bring up the images. Yeah, I think that would be helpful, Daniel. Thanks. Sure. Tammy, are you able to do it or would you? No, I'm yeah. having issues with my computer. I can't um, share my screen. So. Well, I'm seeing it's page nine, correct, Daniel? That CD953 is the matching streetlight. Five, yeah. And there we go. can everybody see, is my screen displaying now? Yeah, just go up a little bit more. A little bit more. Up oh, there Nine we go. 953C is the matching street light for A and B. Those are different poles, but they look a little like they're more different on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And and it also, and then the other one, is 855 is is item um it is in the non-matching sorry 
what I don't what, what I don't see is that is the CD eight oh eight. Did I miss that? Oh, there it is. Sorry, CD eight oh eight is is D. Okay, so that one is located on page the, eight, correct? Yeah, right there. Yeah, page eight, eight on the right. Okay. And then the one. And the one that's three of 14, I assume, matches the one on page seven on the right. I'm sorry, the other one was on the left. This one's on the right. The one that looks that flat top saucer pole. Okay, so these are all matching. That one matches C in the matching street yep. lights. Yep, yep, got it. So um, can we take these all on consent? Yeah. We have a motion to approve matching street lights A, B, C, and D. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Vincent. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. So I'll do a quick vote. Commissioner Jimenez, how do you yes. vote? Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes. Commissioner Vincent. Yes. Great, and I also vote yes. So these streetlights have been approved. So moving on to the next item, the non-matching streetlights on Figueroa and 28th. Um, this one, um, let's see, Tammy, which, this one is going to be the 951A. 951A. Okay, so that's that's on page nine. Does everybody see that light? Mm -hmm. Okay. So can uh, I ask a question before you go to the next one? So when mm -hmm. we say it's non-matching, it's non-matching up against what? The neighborhood. So um, if you're um, going around the block, the other lights uh, won't match it. Well, I mean, is it going around the block or is it two, two blocks down? I mean, is the, ne is the, the non-matching light a concrete light? So um, attachment B will show the vicinity of the uh, light. And you can see uh, sometimes there's just no lights in the area. And that generally will fall into category three, which is no ex existing street lights. So non-matching means that in the uh, vicinity of the proposed light, there is not one that matches. There are no lights or there's not one that matches what's being put in. There's not one that matches one that's being put in. So there is something there. It looks like something, but it doesn't look like what we're putting in. Right. So in order for us to see that, I've got to go back while we're on this meeting and open up another document and look at it instead of looking at the screen. I just want to make sure I'm understanding what I have to do in order to be able to understand this. I, I really want to get us on sync on how this works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because this is, I, I've always, you know, I, this is years for me now. So I know what a non-matching streetlight is, but I've always understood that to mean that somebody's putting in a light pole that does not match the existing light poles. So because right. there are no dark, totally dark streets in Los Angeles. Right, I think your understanding is correct. So whatever's there, and in light of the conversation we just had, the city's going for cheap, and there was a concrete black and white speckled pole there already, and they needed to add a street light, they would put in the tall slender thing because it's cheaper. That's, um, yeah, that's a probability. That's Commissioner Jefferson, can I jump in for a moment? Yeah, uh, someone um, say, save me. Uh, yeah. I think, so I think going forward, it, I think what would be helpful is to understand, so to Tammy, to understand what the non-match, why it is in the non-matching category. So if there's another streetlight on that same street, 
that might be a different style or if there are if there are others and Tammy if you have that information now if not it might make sense to to hold on this particular uh, this particular one until the next commission meeting so that you can we can we can better present uh, to our commissioners on how we can do that do you are you able to pull it up or is your computer are you frozen um, I, I can't pull up anything on my screen uh, right now. I mean, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm happy to do it if that would be, what's a... I don't know. And if you want, while you're doing that, mm -hmm. item three, which is no existing street lights. We do have images of what those poles look like. And I would be happy to have a, give you a motion to approve the no existing street lights. Agree, yeah. So just for the record, and we can take all of those probably on consent, right? It's A, B, and yes. C. A, B, it's all the same street light. Well, actually, it's 851A and 855. So um, we, have we have images of what we those have, are. We yeah. have images, yes. Yeah. So I, I feel comfortable. Do we have a motion to approve those? I'm moving. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Do we have a second? Is Vincent second. Throws? Second. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll take a we'll take a vote real quick on these. So, Commissioner uh, Jimenez, how do you vote uh, for non no existing street lights A, B, and C? Uh, yes. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes. Commissioner Vincent. Yes. And I vote yes on those. So the, these have all been approved. So um, so Tammy or Daniel, if you have that. Um, Sorry. Um, so you see right there, this one, the street light is on there. So 2A, this one is going to be the 951A, and that's in the package. Okay. On the page. Right, we get that. I guess our problem is, right, Commissioner Jefferson, that we don't know what the other street lights look like. So are these images here, Tammy, of what the the other ones look like on that street? Yeah, so attachment C will show um, all the lights that are in the area. Can everybody see? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and then we're talking about uh, Okay, so right. the one, so as I'm seeing this right now, they have a pole and it has the clean arch. The one you want to put in, which is CD 951 on page nine, is a pole that has a piece sticking off of it. At the right. top. Yeah, the, top. the one on the left. Right, right. The top of it is different. So it's a nice clean arch where it is. And we're going to put this pole in the one on the left, instead of the clean arch poles that are there. Right, that's what the applicant is proposing. Yes, and that would cause me to say no. And the reason I'd say no is because, you go back here, leave that picture up a minute. That pole that's there right now and looking down the street at what they're trying to do is real clean to put the other pole in out of the clear blue sky looks like we went backwards instead of moving forward with the look that they were trying to create in the neighborhood yeah it's a little fussier and we don't happen to have an image of a pole that looks like the one that's up there but that's what the that's what would cause me to say no. Yes, I agree. Even uh, CD eight hundred eight is somewhat closer. It still has a little kind of nub at the top there, but it's yep. less decorative than right uh, nine There's five a, one. Just a really clean look on that, and and. I know, you know, I know that there are really worse things going on in the world than this, mm. where this conversation is, but <laughs> we're trying very hard to finally get ourselves to a point where we just get some consistency. And trust me, Tammy, this is not you. Yeah. 
this conversation is just coming to a head over something we've been trying to get settled for several years. So is there a motion maybe to not approve the streetlight? Is that what I'm hearing? I'm moving not to approve. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Jimenez. <laughs> um, so we'll take a quick vote. Commissioner Vincent, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Jimenez. Yes. Commissioner Jefferson. Yes. And I also vote yes to not approve. So can we look at this next time, Tammy? Is that good? Sure. Um, let me reach out to the BSL engineer um, and see what we can do. So is that the direction then moving forward that we're, um, the, uh, the commissioners would prefer no non-matching streetlight applications that they would uh, they should match when possible? Well, I, I'm not necessarily saying that because I don't <clears throat> what they know what they would be matching to. But in this instance, it's we can see clearly what what I would be saying is no, we want a matching street light in this instance. And I see another instance, depending on what the existing light is and what it is that they're proposing, could be reflection of where they're trying to go in the future, and it's just going to take a while versus looking like they're going backwards. This one to me looks like we're going backwards, not forwards. Okay. I think it's helpful. Thank you, Tammy. And, Thank you, Tammy. Um, I really appreciate you. God, kind of, I appreciate you, know, you. <laughs> Tammy, going through this because this is this is as Commissioner Jefferson said, this is this is years of this. So we're uh, we're working on helping helping streamline it and and get the commissioners that information. So I think in the future, uh, we'll plan on making sure that we can pull the pictures up on screen, assuming that we are on Zoom, so you can see what's matching and what is not. And then also, um, once we come back in person, making sure that that we're able to present all that information too. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be helpful if we were able to have um, a representative from Street Lighting um, sit in in the last part of our meeting, maybe to enlighten us. Or take um, your comments back to Street Lighting. <laughs> or, under, think, or understand what we're talking about. Yeah, I think Tammy will, Tammy will convey those, and I think that that we'll be in touch with street lighting as to the other questions that you raised, um, so we can have somebody here to be able to respond to the to the questions um, and provide more information. And and let me and let me just raise one point: if in fact the answer from street lighting is yes, it would be nice to put in this example we just had. It would be nice to put in one that matches the existing but we can't afford that. We can only afford poll number B. And so that's why we're giving you poll B. Then, then we need to come to a point where there's some reconciliation in the city because there's no point in, there's no point in asking for our approval of something unless we're gonna have a point where there is a, dis where we either have a discussion about overrides or we don't have a discussion about overrides. They come back and say, well, no, I only have a buck 50, so I can only put this poll in. Well, then why are you asking my, my, for my approval over what it looks like? And then if somebody complains one day, the only answer we have to give back is they told us there was only one choice and we didn't have a choice. I'm okay. just, this is the only job this commission has <laughs> in real life, honestly. And there's going to be a moment when someone looks up and goes, how this happened? The commission. And, and I just, I, that's not, I mean, I, I got a lot of bad legacies, but that's not the one I want. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the poll you showed us, Tammy, that, you know, was what the clean arch poll. I'm totally fine with that. Love I don't that. like those finials. I don't like all this gobbledygook on it with some top that looks like and don't come stick some atf <laughs> box on it either yeah, just, exactly. just <laughs> we feel like we're being set up so i, I know i do push I the, the arch clean pole love it and poor ray jimenez he's like so new to us he's like what is this i'm like if you knew how long we've been trying <laughs> it 
Oh, my. Never ending uh, polls and boxes. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's at the end of the meeting, and we're all burnt out. And, too. and we're all like, can't we just go? I home? haven't eaten lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I kept going off screen. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tammy. We appreciate all the and work. You too, and you too, Daniel, because we know that you're trying very hard to then we, diplomatically go back and share this discussion with somebody. We absolutely thank you. I appreciate that. We are trying. It is a step-by-step -step process. As you know, Commissioner Jefferson is the longest standing member of this commission. <laughs> Tammy is has taken on a new approach, which we definitely appreciate on We're getting there. the architectural projects. Um, and I think that each each opportunity we have, and as she gets continues to get more insight into your thinking, um, to be able to make sure that what she has to present um, and what the projects that come forward will really be able to be more tailored uh, to the questions that you're asking. So thank you for your patience as as we continue to 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 navigate through these challenges. And it might thank be you. worth just finding out: Are they trying to get to a point where they have solar panel poles? You know. Yeah. That, that, no, I mean, really, that that pull in solar power into the yeah, pole no, so that yeah. if there's a blackout, the lights will still come on. Because if so, that'll That's ultimately one day great. require something else. And maybe they can use some of the federal infrastructure money. Right. And also, you know, sad to hear that all these companies have gone out of business. I mean, for someone in street lighting, there's a business opportunity in Los Angeles. Um, anyways, should we move on to the next? Yes, do we yes. want the general manager's report or the nomination of officers? So, do we do nomination of officers next since it's that's how it's on the agenda, Daniel? Yeah, that would be great. Why don't we why don't we do that? So, it's that time of year again um, for the terms. I know that Commissioner Scrofano has been the president for the last year, and Commissioner Ho has been. Uh, the vice president uh, of the commission and both have done uh, great work. So leave it to the commissioners to uh, make a nomination. How, how do we do usually that? The, usually the, the vice chair goes into the chair and we, I mean, that's usually what we nominate. The vice chair goes into the right. chair and then and then someone who hasn't served in an officer role goes into the vice chair. Vice chair. I've done both. <laughs> may, may I suggest that we yeah. table this um, only because we only have four commissioners. And um, I don't know if somebody who is not being represented may be interested. thought <laughs> yeah that that's a thought um i think it absolutely i think it can be tabled the the sequence of timing has been uh the nominations happen in april um the vote happens in may so that the change in leadership will happen in june um for the one year but we can also hold until hold until the next meeting too um, um well so could you it. Okay. Could you, is the issue that you could, I mean, that we could nominate and then you, somebody goes back and asks whether they want to do it? <laughs> we can't ask, but you can. Sure. I'm, I'm happy to, to I mean, follow I, back up. Um, I mean, our vice president is, is, is not even present. So. Right. I, right. I, I, I agree with you. It's, yeah. I agree. I, I think we, we need to move on until we have more representation. It just it just means that if we do that, then it means that Scarfano is on a month longer. You, and I'm OK with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and I think we want to, you know, I think there there could be an opportunity. Uh, Commissioner Scarfano, I think, has been on and Commissioner Ho have been uh, in their leadership roles through this entire through the virtual time um, and haven't had a chance to do it in person yet either. So. Um, uh, and oh, as we look ahead. Uh, yeah, oh, no, not as president, though. Oh, you're right. You're the vice president. Right. And I have to tell you, I do not like Zoom. For the record, it's so much easier to run a meeting in person. Than Zoom. Totally agree. Totally agree. So, I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, 
if we want to table this, that's fine. I know Daniel, you had some thoughts. So do you want to, how do you want to do it? Do you want to talk to everybody and. Sure. I mean, I think what we can do is we can uh, nominate and vote in the next meeting. Um, I know that it is possible that certain commissioners that are here today may not actually be here at the next meeting. Um, so we'll talk, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk to the commissioners and, and, and get their sense so that we can, uh, in the event that someone may not be here, um, that they would be willing to serve um, if that's the case. So we can do that. We can nominate and, and vote in the same meeting too. And is there a possibility we might end up with one more meeting that is voting for a Zoom meeting? My sense right now is that we'll be, we'll be remote, and I'll, I'll talk about this in my report, but uh, we'll be remote in May, May for sure, and probably June. But, um, but I anticipate that we'll be back. It just, you know, I think that we're, we're in the process. And again, I'll, I'll jump into my report momentarily, yeah. but we're in the process of, of our reconstitution, bringing staff back to the office uh, in May. Um, so we'll have to determine if we're prepared in June so or my, if it makes sense. My, for my, only, my only point in asking was whether or not the next time we have a special meeting to, do, to vote on having a meeting on Zoom could we take either the nomination or the election in, depending on what the cycle is? Yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah that's well, that's great because I think we're kind of all burnt out by the end of some of yeah. these meetings. Right. Absolutely, I think that's possible. So we'll look at the calendar and determine if there's a need for a special meeting between now and May or between May and June, uh, and we'll certainly be in touch on that um, on that part of the process. Yeah, and I you. will be gone on the for the May meeting. I be in Italy, flying back. Oh, <laughs> oh I am so excited <laughs> to to go out of the lower forty eight. So, um, so do we want to continue then, Daniel, with your general manager's report, and we'll table item nomination of officers to the next meeting. I'm happy to, to start and we can certainly yeah. table that if that's the will of the commission. Yes. 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 Great. Um, no, I know that everybody is, uh, we are at, 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 we've been here for a while. So um, let me just do a really quick update and then I can hold on the next part of my presentation if you would like, um, just to kind of go through some of the agenda and some of the other pieces that that we are gonna cover. But jumping in real quick on the announcements, um, April's been been a great month so far um, and it's Arts Month. So we are highlighting a comprehensive list of events throughout the month. Um, there are arts programs supported through DCA grants, partnerships, and featured in, in our festival guide and in our social media. So uh, we can also keep you updated um, on what those events are. Um, based on Commissioner Vincent's uh, request, so that that we can update you on that. Um, on a, several, a few other items, wanted to let you know that as we look ahead to April 29th, um, as the 30th anniversary of the LA civil unrest, uh, DCA is commissioning a total of six playwrights, actors, and spoken word artists to create and perform original work, historical works at the Lamert Park Cultural Hub, um, which we're very excited about. It's in conjunction with Monumental Los Angeles and actors will perform monologues, short plays and poetry, all taking place in Lamert Park, Plaza Park um, in front of the installation of Hank Willis's, Hank Willis Thomas's All Power to the People at 3 p.m., approximately the same time the acquittals were announced. And that's and on what? April April 29th. Uh, next, just wanted to let you know that we've been working with council member Bob Blumenfield to shape and transform Canoga Park um, in the commercial neighborhood into the Canoga Park Arts District. So we're actually very excited about this. We're creating a cultural and performance arts corridor with its purchase and acquisition of a facility now known as a Tosco Theater. Um, based on the strategic plan that we developed for the Madrid Theater um, and at the Canoga Park Youth Arts Center, the Tosco Theater will be the only publicly owned uh, facility that'll provide the neighboring communities opportunities to develop and produce diverse family-friendly theater and performance arts programs. Uh, DCA's performing arts program 
We'll be hosting a number of performance art residency programs at the Tosco Theater. Also wanted to let you know that we started our spring class sessions um, at our art centers. We're very excited about those. Uh, and just a few internal updates. So on hiring, um, we are continuing to make process. We brought on several new staff members um, to support the department, including Holly Hawk House and the department's personnel resources. Uh, we're very excited about those folks. And then later in the month and next, uh, early next month, we anticipate we'll have more staff coming on to our performing arts program, our public art program, our grants program, and community arts. So uh, very excited in the what has been a very slow hiring process um, to be able to bring staff on to assist in our reconstitution. So we are moving forward on reconstitution. Our admin team is working feverishly to make sure that our sites all have the appropriate signage um, and appropriate PPEs for the safety of our staff um, and visitors. Our, DC, our theaters are open now. Um, several of our partner art centers are open and we've started programming at some of our uh, DCA managed centers. So we are making great progress. We're really excited um, to be welcoming our communities back to our sites. Um, and additionally, we'll also start bringing staff back to the main office, the main offices and to all of our sites uh, beginning in kind of mid to early to mid May, um, which we are very excited about. Staff will start coming back a few days a week and we'll continue to work remotely for a few days. Um, and that process will be a transition that we'll see over the next few months. So at this point, I, I did put together a quick walkthrough of, of the agenda following up on our last meeting. Um, I'm happy to do it. I'm also happy to pause and do it at the next meeting if you'd like to hold, if everybody is, uh, is if it's past time. So you all let me know what you'd like to do and I'm happy to, to move forward that way. You're muted. Hey, Mr. Vincent. Vincent, we can't hear you. I was just going to suggest we could integrate it with the elections. Absolutely. So we can all hold on that then. Uh, and we will, uh, it will either be depending on if a special meeting is needed. Uh, it'll either be during a special meeting or it will be uh, during the next commission meeting. So. Can I just ask you the status of Vision Theater? The status of Vision Theater? Um, from the last update that I heard, we are. We are continuing to push forward. I know engineering is really pushing hard to um, get it finished and, and up and running. We're currently working on the mural um, on the ceiling within the Vision Theater. Uh, and concurrently, our team is working on the RFP process uh, for the operator uh, to operate the theater, so. So the operator's not selected yet? Correct. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, if there, if there are no other questions, um, thank you all for your fortitude um, as we continue coming through uh, all of our, as we start trying to make sure that we're addressing your questions to the best that we can, uh, we'll, we'll continue doing that. Uh, thank, thank you again for your patience um, as we continue to try and get the best answers and the best responses for you so that you'll have the information um, at the first at the first opening um, and the first part of the conversation so yeah and we want to thank you guys too because Tammy I know you're 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 new to all this and you're doing a great job and and uh, Ben those presentations were excellent today yep. and it's really exciting at least from my end that we have stuff beyond AGFs and streetlights we're looking at and that we actually have art activation projects architectural projects so I think we're all excited in the days coming up that you know you guys are doing some great work so and Juan thank you too for sending all the, all the different I made a suggestion just so you all the commissioners know that maybe it is easier and I think we can all talk about this maybe in the next meeting about if if it's more PDF attachments that are sent to us that are easier to open. I'm kind of struggling a little bit with the Google Docs and it downloading and not downloading. So I think we should probably bring that up in. Sure, let's let's talk about that. Um, yeah. We wanna make sure again, 
Um, this, will, this is something we'll cover, but just so that everybody is aware and for the public that's listening to all of the documents are available. There's a link on the agenda at the top of the agenda uh, that show that takes the link to the presentation documents. So we'll make sure to get you those um, as attachments. I think that that they will end up coming as a zip file to you because there's so many attachments. So hopefully everybody will have the capacity to be able to download them. But I think that we'll also keep them in the Google Drive folder uh, so that so that people so the public can access them there too. So great. Right, I wanted to um, jump in here. So the way we have it formatted is that every application is one PDF. So you would never have to open more than one PDF for every application, regardless of what it is. So we just wanted to make it as easy as possible for the commissioners uh, to be able to review it. And they should all be formatted the same. I know some people like to see hard copies. So uh, previously what was being uh, sent out was you, you might have an eight and a half by 11 and then a 24 by 36. I've worked with the applicants to streamline this process so you could just print it from your regular printer and it should not be an issue. Some, there are some sheets that need to come in at 11 by 17 because at uh, eight and a half by 11, they're not legible. So uh, we, we have tried to streamline that so that it's very easy for you guys to read and print. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Vincent. And, and actually, I was just going to say, I don't think that that's the, I mean, first off, I appreciate that. I think I probably not mastered how to be on a meeting, be paying attention to what everybody's doing and be trying to look at a set of documents on my screen, unless I pull them up on my other computer. So that that's, I think that's where from our side, we're probably good. And this is not just you. I have this with other meetings all the time. And so it's a matter of, of how much did I memorize before I got on. And, but if I'm assuming that someone's going to roll it up on the screen, then I've looked at it, but I haven't tried to memorize it. So if you guys have it ready to roll up, it, it, it's fine, but keep sending us the links, the whatever, however many versions of ways you can think of doing it. Cause each one of us has a different computer system. And I appreciate it all. Thank you. With that, I have to sign off. So I bid you all adieu. Um, enjoy your time before I see you again. Well, yep. thank you. If you're thank signing you. off, then we will lose quorum. So, yes. So, Stefano, you want to end the meeting? Yes. So, the meeting is adjourned and I don't have a gavel. So, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for being patient. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.